In this video we're going to talk about electronic spectra. This is when uh, an electron from a filled orbital uh, will be promoted by absorption of light uh, up to an unfilled orbital. And the gap that it, it jumps here uh, is going to be equal to en the energy is equal to Planck's constant times the frequency which is Planck's constant times velocity of light over the wavelength of the light absorbed and that wavelength is usually measured in nanometers <clears throat> so typically for a spectrum then we might uh, expect to see something uh, on a graph um, that is usually drawn with absorbance which has no units as such or at least uh, it's measured in absolute units typically up to about two but they can go higher but usually most spectrometers are working in the range between about zero and two units and the absorbance is actually the log of the ratio of intensities of light passing through a spectrometer first without the uh, sample presence in the beam and then the sample in the beam usually done in solution uh, so that uh, the comparison is, reflect, is the, a measure of the uh, amount of light that's been absorbed. Now the light that uh, is absorbed is going to be a very varied wavelength typically most spectrometers would start around 200 nanometers so this is the wavelength of light that's absorbing. Uh, below 200 is way down in the UV and usually more specialized in nature uh, spec uh, type of spectrometer. And uh, most spectrometers will go up to say 900, 915 nanometers, something like that uh, in the visible range. Um, typically uh, the visible range starts around 350 uh, below that we consider that in the UV range. So if we take a, a solution, we'll say that it's a colored solution and we run the spectrum, uh, we'll probably get something maybe that looks something like this. So going back to our original diagram here, the gap that is jumped here is going to dictate where the absorption takes place in the lambda there and so one ends up on the graph with peaks uh, here and here reflecting two, tran two such transitions, electronic transitions taking place in this spectrum. Now we ran this solution for a particular concentration if we halve that concentration and run it again quite often we'll get a spectrum that will look something like that and if we halve the concentration another time then we'll get a uh, not quite right but uh, fairly good um, that will look like that now when we want to compare uh, um, traces what we need to do is to take the measurement of the absorption at a particular wavelength. We could choose any wavelength but the comparison must be done for all three traces at the same wavelength. Now which wavelength we choose uh, is um, best chosen by uh, one that shows a lot of change with the parameter that we're trying to look at, in this case concentration. But we could choose any wavelength but obviously we're going to get the best discrepancy if we choose wavelength something like this so if we choose this particular wavelength take the measurements here here and here then we can plot another graph and in this case it's going to be uh, absorbance against concentration and so for instance we might have uh, the first point gives us uh, a data point up there, half the concentration, so we're going to be down here, and the in fact the absorbance is about half as well, <coughs> excuse me, 
and then again for the third trace about half the concentration and we're down here halving the absorbance again so you can see that with luck we're going to be able to draw a straight line between these points and in that case we can say that the absorbance is therefore proportional to the concentration and that is what Beer's law is all about the absorbance relates to the concentration in a direct fashion um, now it's quite possible that uh, it isn't a straight line and that's why we always have to check to make sure that it does in fact uh, relate to the concentration it could be curved down below here or up here or the whole thing could be curved and so one has to uh, check that each time the some compounds will be uh, obey Beer's law in one solvent but not in another solvent some compounds don't obey Beer's law at all so uh, it is quite varied however if it does obey Beer's law then it's a very useful parameter and it's used in an enormous number of spectrometers different types of spectroscopy uh, use Beer's law uh, as its basis and the simple example here is that if we want to know the concentration of a solution that has absorbed in an, in an electronic spectrum, we can do measurements to draw a graph exactly like this, only we've used solutions of known concentration of the same substance uh, as the test case. Once we have the straight line graph established, then we can take the test solution uh, run the absorbance and measure the intensity and then of course when we run the perpendicular down to the x-axis we will know the concentration of our test solution. Now we've said that the absorbance is proportional to the concentration now in fact it's obviously going to be equal to a constant times the uh, concentration and that constant is going to be a measure of the path length in centimeters we usually use one centimeter cells for those case most cases the concentration and we introduce another parameter epsilon and the epsilon is called the molar absorptiv absorptivity or the molar extinction coefficient and this is epsilon the value of epsilon depends very much on the type of transition that ta is taking place that we're looking at so you can see just by simple comparison of the two peaks in our original spectrum they must have different v values of epsilon uh, because they have different size peaks recall that the energy gap the lamb is reflected in the lambda down here and the uh, larger the gap between the transition taking place the smaller the lambda the inverse relationship so this is the high energy range and to the right is the lower energy range um, but the type of transition taking place gives rise to the size of the peak so a, a transition that can take place very easily uh, called an allowed transition will give very large peaks and uh, a technically forbidden transition will give quite small peaks. So examples of uh, allowed transitions will be metal to ligand or ligand to metal uh, charge transfer and that is where we will have numbers in the order of epsilon equal to about 40 or 50,000. Uh, notice that the units of epsilon are going to be in liters per mole per centimeter, in other words the inverse of L times C so that A ends up with no units at all. Uh, other transitions for instance the DD transitions that are technically forbidden will be much smaller uh, they still take place but they're technically forbidden and they'll be in the say 10 to 50 range. What allows a transition to be uh, more readily undertaken than another depends on what's in the molecule so for instance uh, conjugation will affect both epsilon and lambda in an organic compound and uh, the shapes will affect uh, the DD transitions in inorganic compounds so to recap we've uh, looked at the general causes of UV-Vis spectra and how they might be used 
uh, for the uh, quantitative determination of a concentration.